Now this video is really a follow-on from the last video, which was a suggestion to Extinction Rebellion to do a popular debt strike for climate emergency. Uh, the reaction was mixed and I got the strong impression that people didn't really understand uh, the subtleties behind what I was saying. Okay, I'm going to explain the subtleties to you. If you could stop greenhouse gas emissions almost instantaneously, maybe within days or weeks, and to do that you had to implode the global economy, would you do it? So the first question to ask is, am I just posing a false dichotomy? Is it a question of the economy versus saving the planet? And I'm saying that's not a false dichotomy. Really, those are your two choices. The Industrial Revolution has caused the greenhouse gas emissions, and they are causing the environmental destruction now that will lead to species extinction in the near term. Up till now, the debate has been upside down. The debate has been, okay, let's just say that on this hand, we have a Fabergé egg. It's irreplaceable. It's planet Earth. We don't have another one. If this gets broken or dented or even slightly cracked, we all go extinct. So you can't experiment with this. You, you can't, it's sacred. You can't basically make any bets that are not infinite on it. Any bets that you make on this Fabergé egg are effectively an infinite bet. Okay, that's what you have in this hand. Now in this hand, you have the global economy. You have the industrial economy, the military-industrial complex. Now this is a madman invention. You can kick it around. You can melt it down to the ground. It can collapse, and you can recreate it again. It collapsed in 1908. It collapsed in 1929. It collapsed in 2008. In fact, all it really does is collapse and rebound. It's a rubber ball. You can recreate this at will. We've had economies left and right. Uh, there's nothing special about an economy. It's definitely not sacred. You can experiment with it. Uh, all it does is cause a bit of harm to a few people temporarily. This is not a Fabergé egg. This is a Fabergé egg. What economists, what the establishment, what politicians have been saying is that you cannot touch the sacred cow, the economy. That's a thousand dollar bet we have down and that cannot be put at risk because of this infinite bet that is a Fabergé egg. First of all, you have to prove to me that the Fabergé egg is at risk and I need to see the science, which should be the other way around. In order to have an economy, the burden of proof is on you to prove that that will not damage the Fabergé egg. The upside-down world where you have to prove that the economy is going to cause harm is completely nuts. To have an economy, the burden of proof is on you to prove that it won't harm the planet. Now the science is in. The science says that the economy not only cracks the planet, not only dents it, it blows it completely away, and soon, catastrophically. So we have a gun to our head. That's an infinite bet. There's no bet on the economy that you can make that is comparable to the infinite bet you have where everything's on this table. So once you get that, then it's an easy bet to say that the economy has to go. Great! So now you might be asking, yeah, but how do we stop the global economy? It's relatively easy. It's been wired up with a nuclear bomb at its heart. It's primed. It's relatively easy for a small number of people to walk over, press the big red button, and detonate this bomb. How big is this bomb? Well, it's absolutely unimaginably huge and it's primed to blow. So to put it in perspective for how big this bomb is, it's a nuclear weapon for stopping climate catastrophe. 
The size of this bomb is debated. No one really knows how big it is. And it's a very po politically sensitive issue. You will actually find opposition to any inquiry into exactly how big this is because it is so big and it's such a sensitive issue. So this is top secret information in terms of how big it really is and how much is at risk. So places like the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, they estimate that it's around 700 trillion. 700 trillion dollars. That's 10 times the size of the global GDP. The global GDP is about 70 trillion. This is 700 trillion in outstanding over-the-counter debt. Now, they're probably lying, okay? Independent estimates put it at probably double that. It's probably credibly about 1.2 quadrillion dollars. Somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 quadrillion dollars. That's a thousand trillion. It's an unimaginable amount, probably 20 times the GDP, maybe 30 times the GDP of the entire globe. Now, what this bundle is, is the derivative market. Warren Buffett in 2003 called it financial weapons of mass destruction. These financial weapons of mass destruction are primed and ready to blow because a large portion of them are things like CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and particularly things like CDSs, that's collateralized debt swaps. They insurance for financiers against a default. So if you have a default, a relatively minor default, in my view, as long as it's a mass default across the board, CDSs will kick into play and they basically insurance claims on your default. The insurance claims, CDOs, mortgage-backed securities, all these financial instruments, these uh, derivative instruments is what they're called, uh, will melt down to the tune of 1.5 quadrillion if you have a big enough default. Now, I would say that's a relatively and surprisingly small number of people defaulting. And the reason I say it is because there's 1.6 trillion uh, in debt in, say, student loans. Now, that alone uh, could explode and bring, bring down the entire house of cards. Uh, Mortgage-backed security. So in 2008, uh, the subprime loan crisis was enough to melt down this uh, entire balloon of financial instruments. So it doesn't take much in terms of popular action to, uh, to blow this apart. And if it was blown apart, uh, it's hard to put into words how devastating this would be for the global economy. It would stop China in its tracks. Uh, all the growth that China is doing, one belt, one road, is being done by debt financing. So the bond markets would collapse. Uh, China would be unable to grow. Uh, the, the world economy would collapse to the extent that greenhouse gases would probably go to very low percentages almost instantaneously. Uh, things like fracking were all done by leverage. So all the oil that's been produced by fracking was done by private equity. It was done by loans. Uh, if there was no loan market, fracking would stop. The tar sands in Canada, all these things were, were done with debt. So what a collapse of the derivatives market would be is that there is no hedge for debt. And if there was no hedge for debt, there would be no debtors and there, because there would be no creditors. Now, to put in perspective how big the derivatives market is, if you imagine all the nuclear weapons that China has dropped on the manufacturing heartland of the world, that's probably only 10% of the effect that a collapse in the derivative market would have. 
Now, economists will tell you, oh, yeah, but it's not like he says there's counterparty risk, and each, uh, each bet in this derivatives market has a counterparty, which is a counter bet, and so then it all nets out to zero, and so there is no risk in the system. It's horseshit, absolute horseshit, because each one of those counterparties has a piece of paper. They have a contract saying, I have this derivative instrument, and they declare it on that book, on their books, as a positive asset, and both parties do. In truth, if all the debtors in this casino actually had to pay up on their bad debts, the system would collapse and collapse in total. But more than that, it would destabilize the markets to the point of collapse. So, for example, the bond markets would come unstuck. Now, the bond markets are primed for collapse. Bond apocalypse is around the corner. We've uh, just seen a switch in long and short term yields. Uh, and so that signals a collapse in the bond market. In fact, the financial markets themselves all over are primed to melt down at any stage. What I'm proposing with a debt strike for climate emergency is to just do it sooner and do it more thoroughly. If there were enough people to participate in a debt strike. It's not a question of creating risk in the markets. Financiers like risks because they can profit from risk. What it would do is create uncertainty. Financiers hate uncertainty. They can't price uncertainty. And so that would mean that they cannot make a profit from uncertainty. So. The mere fact that you don't know how many people would come on board with a debt strike means that there's uncertainty. That uncertainty alone would make the financial markets come unstuck. So there's only one question to ask. Now that I've explained to you that collectively we have this bomb primed under the military industrial complex, the only question is, do you ignite it? Do you press the big red button? Now, all over social media, I'm seeing these posts saying, well, I want to be able to say to my great-grandchildren that I didn't stand by and I did everything I could. Well, once you've watched this video, you can no longer say you did everything you could if you fail to press the big red button. If you're too squeamish to cause an economic meltdown around the world, then you ha are culpable for not having done enough against the climate emergency. So I've explained in this video that you have the power. You have the power to stop greenhouse gases in their tracks. I've explained how you can do it. And the only thing stopping you is the fact that you are too squeamish to stop a collapse of the global economy. It means that you put the global economy ahead of this Fabergé egg, ahead of climate emergency and our extinction. So you have no excuses to your grandchildren, and I think it's highly debatable that you even have grandchildren at this stage. In fact, if you have any grandchildren, I think that they will basically be babies born in front of the steamroller. And I don't think you're going to have any great-grandchildren. -grand so that's the reality. The question is, now I've shown you the trigger, will you pull it? So here's my suggestion. I think that the Duma community should get together. We should have a little conference. We should, we should have a little video conference, um, a public one. And all the people in the Duma community should get together and discuss this question. Should it be done? So, yeah, I think that Environmental Coffee House, Sandy, and uh, Collapse Chronicles, Hambone, um, Black Bear News, uh, Torsten in uh, Going South, I think we should all get together, have a video conference, public discussion, and decide whether this is something that should be done. Should we detonate this nuclear bomb now that you know that, that it exists. Uh, and 
I would propose that the next thing to do is, if people agree that we should do it, then the next stage is to go and find some uh, people that are trustworthy to estimate how big a movement this would have to be. In other words, how much participation would you need for a debt strike? How big would this debt strike have to be in terms of dollars and in which sector, which kind of loans, uh, for it to melt down the derivatives market? And I would, some names come to mind. Uh, I would suggest think, people like Nassim Taleb, uh, Max Kaiser, Stacey Herbert, maybe Yanis Varoufakis. I think as a community, all the Duma tribes could lobby people like that to just weigh in with an opinion on whether a debt strike uh, on November the 5th would be feasible to melt down the global economy. And if it is feasible, how big would it have to be? Then, if it looks reasonable and doable, then I'd say we go on to the next stage. And the next stage, in my view, would be to get celebrity endorsement. So to get uh, sponsors and celebrity endorsement, and then to go ahead with a campaign for a debt strike for climate emergency. If we leave it up to people like uh, XR, you can see them going off track uh, already. I, I mean, I see them talking to politicians uh, as if this is going to do something. Like, if you're in XR, understand this. The problem is beyond politicians. Politicians cannot do anything against growth. They cannot do anything against the global economy. They can't damage the football in any way. It's a sacred cow that they cannot touch. So talking to politicians about climate emergency is a complete waste of time because the only action that is possible to mitigate climate emergency is to affect the economy, and that's out of their power. They do not have the power as politicians to damage the economy. You do, and the means you have to doing that is a debt strike, a popular debt strike, particularly in America. It would halt... Uh, China. It will hold China in its tracks. China, the infrastructure in China is being built with debt financing. They are about to go out and get a huge amount more, of more debt. One Belt, One Road is being funded with debt. The scramble for the Arctic is being done with debt. So China would collapse if there was a collapse in the debt markets. China's growth is predicated on debt. So yes, you have to stop China and to stop greenhouse gases. China and America can be stopped almost instantaneously with a meltdown of the global economy. And that's probably the only way this is going to happen. If there's a meltdown in the global economy, then you can start talking about all these crazy schemes like Green New Deals. See, the problem with the Green New Deal is that Roosevelt's Green New Deal was a plan to build up after collapse, so after there was a complete collapse of the economy in 1929, then the Green New Deal, or rather Roosevelt's New Deal, was a plan for how to build the economy back up again. Now, I would say we shouldn't be building the economy back up again, but I'm sure that uh, liberals and uh, the bourgeois uh, would love to build it up again. So you first have to break the economy down and then you can propose a Green New Deal for how to build it up. You see, otherwise, conservatives are just going to say, look, it ain't broke. What are you trying to fix? Someone like President Trump would say that this is the best economy we've ever had. What are you trying to fix? What is this Band-Aid for? They don't believe that there is a climate emergency because they don't want you touching their sacred cow, which is the economy. I'm proposing we kill the sacred cow and then we have their attention. Then the discussion is, do we revive the sacred cow? And if so, can it be revived in a responsible green manner? In other words, with things like a Green New Deal. You cannot get this crack habit of the global economy and transform it. There's no methadone to replace this crack. There's no such thing as sustainable development. It's an oxymoron. All development 
requires growth. You can't do what the economists say. The economists will tell you, well, yes, we can't have any more quantitative growth, but we can have qualitative development. That's nonsense. If you're Chinese and you want to increase your standard of living, you can't have somebody say to you, well, you can't increase your standard of living by quantitative development. In other words, you can't have more stuff. You can only have more quality of stuff. In other words, qualitative development. It's absolutely meaningless. To increase your standard of living as a Chinese, it means that you need a car. It needs that you need more electronics. It means that you have to start eating beef. It means that you ha have to start eating more meat. That's what, mean, what it means to increase your standard of living. A qualitative increase in your life requires more stuff. And that requires quantitative development. So, there is no green economy. The only way to make people's quality of life improve is to have more stuff. If we have more stuff, the only way to produce that stuff is with more consumption and more emission. So, the only way to save this planet is to stop consumption and stop emissions. It's as simple as this. Let me explain it so that grandma can understand it. You've got to stop working and you've got to stop shopping. That's it. So you may say, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive if the global economy uh, uh, collapses? How people are going to eat? Well, it's going to collapse anyway. At some point in this climate emergency, collapse of the global economy is built in. So I'm just saying, do it early. Do it deliberately. While there is still something of the planet left to save, there is still something left of the planet to feed us. If you rely on centralized mass production and distribution of grains to feed the planet, we are in serious, serious trouble. It would be more robust if you destroyed the global economy and forced people to find other means to feed the world. Because it would be distributed production and it would be closer to something that is a sustainable lifestyle. It wouldn't be a lifestyle close to your standard of living today, but that standard of living is going to burn down to the ground anyway because of the climate emergency. So it's just a deliberate decision to give up on your standard of living early and to embrace climate catastrophe uh, through the extinction of the economy first rather than the extinction of the species. And that's really what's at stake. So as usual, I look forward to your comments and let's just get together and discuss this point is now that we know that there is this bomb wired at the heart of the system is are we prepared to detonate it? Do we press the red button? I say we do. What do you say?